Hi, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm Sandy Mason with the University of Illinois Extension as the State Master Gardener Coordinator, and I am so glad you decided to join us here at Mid-American Gardener. Of course, this is your opportunity to get some answers to your gardening questions. And we really look at all things gardening. Maybe you're thinking about next year what you can plant, or maybe you're thinking about this year and what you wish you hadn't planted. I know I have a few of those that sometimes I wish I really didn't plant. So we have a great group of panelists as usual, and they are experts in their field, but they're also gardeners. So we try to share our experiences with you. And uh, Kent, I know you have lots of experience. So what kinds of things do you like to talk about and then okay. on to your show and tell. Um, I'm the owner of Illinois Willows. We're located in western Champaign County. Uh, we're a specially cut flower grower. Uh, we deal primarily with cut flowers, as in annuals, perennials, uh, woody ornamentals. And tonight for the show and tell I brought a uh, one of our bunches of the uh, persimmon color uh, slosia or brain slosia because of the texture uh, it's nice and velvety, uh, has a really nice rich color for the autumn, and it makes a wonderful dried flower. Uh, and so we do this, um, this series or variety uh, in, in three different colors. So. I, I actually love that color for fall. Yeah. You can see how it's, it's, it's that wonderful kind of transition. Mm -hmm. But so how long would something like that last as a cut flower? Uh, as a cut flower, you're probably looking at at least a minimum of seven to 10 days in a vase. Okay. And, and then, then if you wanted to dry, dry it, it, would you just dry I would just, just probably the uh, hang them upside down. Hang them upside yeah. down if you yeah. truly wanted to dry yeah. it. So, and then the color would pretty well stay. Pretty much, yeah. Nice, nice. Yeah. Very good, yeah. Kent. That always sounds like a fun thing to do, the fall. Drying, drying flowers. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer? Hi, I'm Jennifer Nelson. I'm a horticulturalist and you can find me online. I have a blog called Grounded and Growing and I like general horticulture, uh, vegetable gardening and houseplants I would say would be my favorite things to talk about. And I have a viewer email that has a problem with her strawberries. Uh, she is raising Ozark Beauty, ever bearing strawberries. Uh, the First crop in the spring had no problems with it, but then later on in the season, as she harvests them uh, and, they and she lets them ripen, they turn to mush. And she's wondering what's wrong. She doesn't see any sort of mold going on. And she has another bed of honey eye berries that are a June only harvest, and she had zero problems with that. And that leads me to believe she probably has a, a good infestation of what we what's called spotted wing drosophila. It's a newer species of fruit fly to the area, and it loves ripe fruit. And it doesn't go after overripe fruit like most uh, fruit flies. It goes after that perfect strawberry that you've been watching and waiting to ripen. Uh, so actually, what's happening is the larvae are in the fruit and eating it and turning it to mush. So yeah, that's kind of that's yuck. what we say gross. Gross. I think I'm pretty sure. So. Uh, any way to deal with it? Um, keep your fruit picked. Um, there are some insecticides that can help kill the adults. It's not going to help once you have fruit that are turning to mush. Uh, but make sure you're cleaning up the area this time of year. And the, they overwinter as adults, which I found interesting. Um, so keeping the area clean. But um, if you wanted to go after the adults, permethrin, spinosad, and malathion but use according to the label, of yeah, course. Yeah, that's a tough one. But it, it's always one of those things, if you have an issue like that, is actually just investigate, you know, mm -hmm. kind of be that little science person, you know, <laughs> cut it open, because you'd actually see, you the would little, see them. the little guy inside, which I know sounds really, really gross, but that's how it we is. find these things out. I've it? had them on my blackberries, and I noticed them about a day or two after I picked them, and yeah, right. they were it's mush. better to find them before you eat them than <laughs> like realize afterwards. I'm yeah, or well, you not. just think more protein. Items. Yeah, that's right. We won't worry about that. We won't worry about that part. Okay, very good. Thank you, Jennifer and Shane. I am Shane Culture. I'm one of the family owners of Country Arbors Nursery and Culture Nurseries in Urban, Illinois, and we are a retail garden center and a wholesale grower of perennials, annuals, trees, and shrubs. And I usually deal with only the positive questions and the plants <laughs> that are doing really well. You know, I answer all kinds of questions, especially uh, dry ones this year. And today I brought a show and tell of one of my favorite plants. People during this time of year are always asking about hardy mums and what mums are hardy. And the ones you find in the store, they're a 50-50 shot of getting planted. But this variety is, uh, it's changed botanical names. It was called chrysanthemum, then it was leucanthemum, then it was dendranthemum, and now it's back to chrysanthemum, but just call it a hardy mum. And this variety is called matchsticks, and it's actually a fluted variety of flower, but it absolutely will come back. We have, we have hardly lost any of these 
They bloom much later, so you're talking about October, November, even December. And it'll get about three foot high, three foot wide. We do trim them to the ground in June, and that keeps them a little fuller, uh, a little tighter, and blooming their hearts out. But it really, if you have one of these, it's a plant that your neighbor is going to come by and ask, what kind of mum is that? And there's peaches and pinks, but this is one of the most original ones with the yellow and orange with the little fluted red tips to it. And it's called matchsticks, and just ask for it by Hardy Mum. It's a great I, plant. I actually, I love the flower shape because, you know, so many times that kind of quill type yeah. are not hardy. You know, they're, we fall in love with them and yeah. then they don't come back the next year. And it was so, a real so big really trend nice about five yeah. to ten years ago. Every plant had that quill mm -hmm. on the end. And, and this one stuck around. And again, we've had nothing but great luck. And that's the thing. Everybody wants a plant that comes back. You yeah. only want to do Especially it Especially with moms. Mm -hmm. Especially with moms. It's always a little iffy on Absolutely. that. So thank you very much. It's, I'm making notes of the plants that I want in my own garden. Yeah, I'm going to keep an eye on it all night, thinking. too. I think that might go home with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm thinking that, too, yeah. baby. Okay, we're going to go right to our callers. And online, too, we have Stephanie from Mattoon. And you have a question about, I, I guess, it's viburnums, about invasive roots. Yes, we would like to plant uh, a viburnum on the northeast corner of the house, and it's where our new water access comes into the house, and I wondered if we would need to worry about the roots there. Should we not put it there? Um, I would also like to say thank you very much because of the advice you all gave us. You have saved our 100-year oak tree. Oh, oh, great. Wonderful. We love to hear that kind of stuff. Those are the questions I usually take. I know. I'm sure you <laughs> answered that one, Shane. Exactly. I'm sure that one came from you. Okay, so the concern about, because people often have those questions about when they're planting things, like, mm -hmm. do I need to worry about, obviously, where the water comes in or even sewer systems? So what do you think about viburnums? I've never had an issue at our house. I think she should be fine yeah, with it. I've yeah, the, 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 what most people are concerned about are, are really bigger problems than the viburnum. The only time the viburnum would be a real problem is if you have a broken pipe. And the viburnum oh. simply points that out. So it, <laughs> it searches out water. And if you have a broken pipe, yes, it could get in the pipe and clog it up. But that's probably a good thing. But that's where most people are. You really need to worry about leach fields and those type of area. Around your house, mm -hmm. a viburnum's root system is not enough to really cause any damage at all, unless there's already prior damage. And in that case, like I said, it's just going to point out what you have, which is probably a good thing. So plant away. Yeah. I, yeah. I think the only thing I'd be a little bit concerned, because, you know, if you ever have to do any kind of repair, yeah. you know, we always worry about sure. that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So that would be the only thing, but it's, but it's the problem really is there's so many, we, we talk about that too. If you didn't plant because all the things you had to get <laughs> out, you wouldn't plant anything. And maybe uh, not right on top. That's true. That be, yeah. Give it a little access. Thing. But always good to ask now rather than later yeah. when you're wondering. Ask twice, plant once. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Something like that. I think I've heard that before. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> okay. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. And online, Three, we have Rick from Shelbyville, and you have a question for us, Rick. Uh, yes, ma'am. I've got some moms I planted uh, three or four years ago, and they're real tall and doing great, but they're falling over because they're so tall. And I want to transplant them. Uh, when is the best time to transplant those? And what do I do to keep them up? They're real tall and they're falling over. Okay. Very timely question, yeah. moms. Uh, moms, I as far as the height. You probably would have needed to do some pruning, mm -hmm. you know, like Shane said earlier, you know, back in June, uh, early part of July, um, as probably staking. At this point, yeah. 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 So then if you actually wanted to either move them or divide them mm -hmm. or whatever, what time of year would you think that? I think early spring. Yeah. I, I yeah. would spring. at this point. Yeah, yeah we, we, we transplant them usually in April even May sometimes. And then we try and cut them back, like we all said, in mm -hmm. June. But I always remember on the 4th of July, that's a time to cut back some sedums, some mm -hmm. asters, and your mums. 4th of July, if you haven't done it, that's the day to remember, hey, this is I go see some fireworks and I cut back some plants. <laughs> And it's one of those things, it's actually pretty quick. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. you don't have to, like, just look like, yeah. ping, like off of their heads. That's why I say People off of their heads. They're and, very disappointed in our mannerisms when we cut. They think you know, I'm going to have some ritual, and I just So it's just quick. Them off. So yeah. give them a, and then they branch out. That's yeah. the beauty. Mm -hmm. Then they'll branch out. They'll be mm -hmm. shorter. Yeah, you, you tend to get more flowers, mm -hmm. yeah. so there's some good things to do. That's so when we're planting them in the garden center. So you see these perfect ones in the garden centers, and that's why, because we started mm -hmm. them in June, July. Yeah. Okay, very good. Hopefully that helps. And on line four, we have Kathy from Champaign. She has some rosemary plants. What can we do for you, Kathy? Well, my rosemary plants have done outstanding all summer. Um, and I'd like to bring them in. Um, usually, I consider them a sacrificial plant because they <laughs> dry out 
and they die. So should I cut them down somewhat? You know, um, I know they don't like to dry out, but, you know, give me some advice, please. Okay, very good. Rosemary, I love bringing that one in. and Because it, it's not hardy. That's probably right. the one thing right. we should say, that rosemary is generally not hardy for us, so... Oh, I've seen a couple of different things. I've seen people leave it outside using um, the wall of water is probably the best thing that I've ever seen that you usually see around tomato plants in the spring, but I saw them put it around some rosemary plants and it helped them. And they made it through the yes, winter? Yes, yes, oh, over wow. in Springfield I saw that. Um, I've had some luck bringing it inside, but the water watering indoors is tricky because you you, it's a fine line between too much water and too little water, and if they get too dry, they tend to get spider mite like overnight. So, but I've seen it work. Yeah, I I, I think uh, personally, what I generally do is I let them because they are actually f somewhat hardy. Mm -hmm. uh, I let them go through. I leave them outside and let them go through some cold. Yeah. I mean, actually let them get you know know that it's time to slow down and get dormant, and then I f then I'll finally bring them in. Usually not till like November yeah. or so. Mm -hmm. I leave them in the container. I don't know if yours is in a container, and then and then bring them in at that point. And it seems to be better. It sort of like slows mm -hmm. them down yeah. as it gets them yeah. used to being. Maybe it's the cooler temperatures. Yeah, um, right. Leave them out till then and then maybe bring them in an unheated garage or something like yeah. that for about a week or so. So a little transition to your sure, home temperatures. Right, right, right. But you're right, the watering's the, the yeah. tricky yeah. part because mm -hmm. they don't like to get too dry and they don't like to be too wet. So that's, that's it. but I think it's well worth it. So go for it, Kathy. You've had an opportunity to do that. So I'm glad they did well for you. So I, th I think we're gonna go ahead and go around to our, we have some email mm -hmm. questions. Can we go yeah, ahead and sure. do those? Okay. Uh, we've got an email um, a viewer, uh, Debbie. Uh, she's asking about balloon flower. And she states, uh, when I deadhead my balloon flowers, a white milky substance oozes out. Uh, one year the pot I grew them in was coated with a white substance and turned hard. Is there a way to trim them without the substance appearing and is it dangerous to plants or animals? Uh, what is the best way to deadhead the spent flowers? Um, generally the white substance uh, is going to be when you deadhead, you're gonna, that's when you're going to have the white substance coming out. It's similar to if you have euphorbias, uh, sometimes eclipsias will have a white uh, sappy uh, liquid. And as far as animals, there shouldn't be any problem with that. Uh, birds, cats, dogs. Um, I would probably go ahead and use gloves because sometimes um, those types of plants can give you some skin irritations. So uh, I would wear gloves and perhaps just use the scissors and then clean your scissors um, frequently with uh, perhaps rubbing alcohol. Um, that will help keep them clean and also helps with diseases from one plant to another. Um, generally, I would probably cut back when you're deadheading um, oh, four to five inches and that'll keep the plants thicker, fuller, and then more blossoms. Um, as far as the substance, you know, turning hard, if it's on the soil level, uh, and it's a, this is a potted plant, it could be um, kind of a salt buildup, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, it, it shouldn't bother the plant or the roots. Okay, very good. So one thing we don't have to worry about, right. maybe. <laughs> yes. Very good. Uh -huh. And Jennifer? Okay, I've got a question from a viewer who has squash bugs, and she's convinced that they killed her zucchini. Uh, she mentions that her zucchini plants turned white before they died, and coincidentally, that's when the bugs showed up. I don't think that the white color is necessarily caused by the, the uh, squash bugs. I think that's just a coincidence. There are some mildews that can affect zucchini, and there's also just some zucchini varieties that have kind of a whitish cast to their leaves. Uh, She's moved her plants around the garden, which we recommend doing, but she still gets squash bugs. And that is a really tough problem, especially this time of year. If the populations have built up, they seem like they're just everywhere. Um, unfortunately, the time to control squash bugs was when they're first showing up. And the eggs are actually really large, and you can see them under the leaves and just remove those leaves from the garden. They're a pretty tough bug to take care of, um, to control. Uh, you can put some boards out in the garden. They'll collect kind of under the boards and remove them that way. You can also put out newspapers and kind of do the same thing. 
uh, for control if you wanted to do like a garden dust that contains carbaryl or permethrin, those will work, but read the directions, of course. Um, but the big thing for squash bugs is to clean up all the debris in your garden, and this time of year, this is the time to do that. I mean, probably her zucchinis, well, they're dead, but um, all of our gardens are winding down, so make sure you get that plant material out of the garden. The adults over winter, they find cr cracks and crevices. So get that stuff out and get it cleaned up and try to start out with a clean slate for next year. Okay. And that's probably a good lesson for all of us is that late season, if you've had insect or disease problems mm -hmm. on plants, this is a good time to really be thinking about getting that stuff out of Get there. Get it out. Um, and make sure that you don't have problems for next year. Right. So. You may not want to even compost it, depending on how good your compost pile is. Right. right. Okay. Shay? Well, I've got a good question. I've got uh, Joe from Peoria Heights. It says he has a plum tree that was defoliated by Japanese beetles while he was away for the summer and didn't matter if he was there or not, it was probably going to get it. Uh, will it come back in the spring or is it dead? Uh, it said he saw a couple woodpeckers on it. Does it have a chance of surviving? Absolutely. It's a very common question. When the plants look poor, they, they've been skeletonized, but Japanese beetles do not kill plants. It, I, we've, I've been doing this a long time and I've yet to see a plant that uh, is actually killed by Japanese beetles. Most of the time, by the time the Japanese beetles come, July, August, the plant has really stored a lot of its energy and really doesn't even need it. It's just something you have to get past visually. Um, a lot of good trees are not planted like linden because people just don't like looking at the skeletonized leaves. As the trees get larger, you don't notice it as much. So a small shrub like this, you will notice, but it doesn't hurt it. You can, start, you can put seven out. You can do some things to prevent the Japanese beetles from eating on it. You can kill them. They're pretty easy to kill. And then there's cycles. This year was a really rough year. There were a lot out, mm -hmm. but the previous five years, they were pretty much non-existent in many areas around this uh, central Illinois. So it's a, it's a plant or a bug you can certainly live with. People don't like to. I hear it every single day when they come by, <laughs> the phones ring off the wall, but they generally are harmless to the plant. It just harms your psyche as far as what the plant looks like. So it'll come back with a vengeance. Yeah, yeah. So that's at least the good news. So just don't look at that plant for <laughs> yeah, a little while. So uh, just like, it, yeah, it's, it's keep art. walking. Keep Texture walking. and art. Yeah, very good. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shane. And we're going to go back to our callers in online, too. We have Catherine from Clinton. Uh, and you have a problem with your impatience? Yes. I have a bed of impatience out front. And for some reason, they've stopped blooming right in the middle. I've checked them thoroughly to see if there's any bugs on them, but I can't find any. The sides are still blooming fine, but right in the middle it's all just green with no buds or blooms or anything. I wondered what happened. Boy, that's an interesting question. That's a really good mm. question. I'm dying to know. know. <laughs> any uh, thoughts? That's odd. I, I don't know. No, I thought she was coming with they died. That yeah, they, that they well. died. Yeah. So they just, they're one. just staying green but not flowering. So are these just regular garden impatience? Yes. Hmm. All out of the same flat, no doubt. Yeah. Huh. I, I'm not sure, I unless know. you know. Yeah. I, I know I've seen some. You know, if they if they if the leaves still look good, this isn't going to be the issue. But we've actually had, uh, and what I was told is that it might actually be a little mite, but it actually causes some distortion and stuff in the leaves. Um, so they kind of sit there and they don't really, they still look green and they look okay, but they don't flower well. Um, but if you were still look, you know, if the leaves still look huh. healthy, then that's probably not going to be the issue for you. Maybe. Uh, but that would be one thing to investigate a little further. Anybody got any other ideas? That's a tough one. It's hard. Yeah. I was going to guess some disease, but she said it looks fine. Yeah, if they still look good, I'm not sure what else would necessarily do that because we know garden impatients are really good with, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. shade. Right. Shade's not an issue. I assume they got the same amount of watering or anything right. like that that might have happened. Hmm. I don't know. That's really a tough one. Garden mystery. Garden mystery, yeah. I'm sorry we don't have a whole lot of ideas for you on that one, but it'd be worth sort of doing some investigation, especially if you had it year after, you know, more than one year. So that's always, that always makes a, a big difference if it seems to continue. So anyway, so sorry we don't have any more ideas for you, Catherine. And on line three, we have uh, Lina from St. Elmo, and you have Gerber daisies and peace lilies, which sounds like a lovely combination. Yes, I have two questions, please. Okay. My Gerber daisy is very lush, foliage um, does not bloom at all and my peace lily blooms but the tips of the leaves turn brown mm -hmm. so I'm wondering what I'm doing wrong with these two plants my other house plants look gorgeous well peace lilies can be sensitive to extra salts in the water so you start to get that tip browning that you're seeing and there's 
you can try to experiment with what kind of water you're watering with, but you may just want to trim it off if it bothers you. Um, Gerber, a daisy not blooming, they like a little cooler weather than we think that they do, but so they may start to bloom now. My sister has a really large one that always blooms inside over the winter. She hardly ever gets it to bloom during the summer. Um, so maybe look at your fertilizing with that. If you're over fertilizing, you can get a lot of lush green growth and not a lot of flowers. Uh, but those are my my two ideas on that. Yeah, I I know. Does anybody else have another? Gerber daisies have never been an easy one for me. Yeah. I seem to get them in flower, yeah. but I've never been able to really. Maybe keep I shouldn't them, admit that. Keep but them going. <laughs> you know, yeah. to to continue the genetics are getting so much better because as a grower, they always always bloom so much later in the spring. Yeah. You, all your customers are gone by the time your Gerber right. daisies would bloom, but now they're blooming in May when yeah. when they didn't bloom. So now you can actually sell them as a garden center. And, but they do kind of peter out when it starts getting really yeah. hot. But again, they're improving that greatly. Every year we're seeing them bloom longer and longer and longer. But we don't know if hers ever bloomed uh, to start or if it just stopped blooming or never bloomed. And if it never bloomed, you could have, you don't get it often, but you might've gotten a dud. <laughs> you get one that just genetically is not wanting to bloom. And I, and I don't know sometimes with, uh, it, and I, it sounds like it's indoors. So yeah. I don't know how long mm -hmm. they continue to, to flower well. They, I always think of them a little higher light type of plants too, so that's yeah. probably the other part. So hopefully that at least gives you some ideas. And we, we if people have some questions now, we're certainly open for some calls. If you wanna give us some, uh, give us a call, we'd love to have you uh, give us some ideas about maybe some things that are going on in your garden, things maybe you'd like to grow next year and you're not quite sure how to do it. Uh, I, I'm just gonna kind of throw a question to the, to the gang here is, you know, I mentioned Gerber daisies, sometimes they're kind of hard for me to grow. Is there a plant that you seem like you want it, you want to grow it, but it never seems to grow well for you? Have you ever had one like that? Where Because I think people always think, you know, we're somehow experts and everything always grows well for you. But uh, I would put Gerber daisies, I also put Caladiums, another one of those that I, ne yeah. they never seem to look like what I think they, they're not lush. They mm -hmm. don't die, but they're not lush. So have you ever had a plant that you've tried to grow and you just really felt like, um, um, why can't I grow this? <laughs> I, Anybody have I, a we talk about it every year. We have we grow millions of plants, and we we have some of the best growers in the area. But our perennial grower Shandra struggled with um, poppies, poppies because poppies yep, I've heard that before. want bone dry. And here you're trying to grow these lush plants, right. and they don't want to be touched at all. So we killed every poppy. <laughs> and then Stacy, that was on the panel here, when she worked with us, she couldn't grow kale to save her life. It turned into this giant stalk <laughs> every year. So it had like a two foot neck on it with this head on it because we didn't really like to use growth, uh, you know, oh, sure. darkness. So they're just plants that, you know, all these plants and we're so proud and we just can't grow those. And they're saying, well, poppies are in my yard. They're spreading across <laughs> so my easy. neighbors. It's so I easy. can't even spray them yet. We can't grow a poppy to save our life. But I will say this year, Shander had gorgeous poppies and we hugged and celebrated. <laughs> and now uh, she's finally made it past. She can grow anything. I, I think that's probably the best thing about gardeners is that we're optimistic and we just keep trying, right? Yeah. We just keep trying. I keep I'm trying to collate. Right, I'm gonna get it. I'm finally gonna get a ride. Yeah. Okay, we have a we have a caller in line too. Sue from Champagne. She has a question about a uh, flame bush about cutting it back. That's right. I have um, a flame bush and it's about five feet tall and it's very dense. And uh, when do you cut it back and how do you cut it back? So are you hoping to get it shorter? Yes, I'd okay. like it. Besides yeah, just being a bit dense. Shorter, a bit shorter. And it's very dense. Okay. Okay. So so I assume this is burning bush. Is yeah, that what we're talking about? Probably guessing. burning bush. Like, a flame yeah. bush is, is another. It gets really red in the fall. Yeah. It should be pretty forgiving. I, I would do it once the leaves fall and it's dormant. But no, don't take more than 25 or 30 percent off at a time. So you may have to work it back to the height that, that you're wanting over a couple of years. When we trim our fields, we grow a couple thousand in the field every year, and we get the best flush if we trim it early March. So before the leaves have come out, and again, it is very forgiving. You really could do it anytime, but if we do it early March, we get this amazing flush of new growth early spring, and it doesn't seem to affect the look of it the rest of the year. If you do it in the winter or do it now, it looks kind of hacked back the mm -hmm. whole time. 
we like a natural look during the winter. So March is really good, but you, you can't get it wrong. We've even taken the monstrosas, which were 10 or 15 foot tall, and chainsaw them in half <laughs> because a customer really wanted to keep them, and they flushed right back out and looked gorgeous. So yeah. about as forgiving as a plant gets. Yeah, I know. I've, I've actually cut them back pretty hard, yeah. uh, only because I was just trying to see, will this work? Because it was yeah. one of those things I wasn't quite sure it was going to work, so yeah. we just cut it back really hard. And it worked fine. Yeah, it lot, worked the great, old, so. if it dies, then I'm not super hurt, but I'm going to try something and see what happens. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah that's always my, that. my feeling about pruning and stuff like that. Yeah. Just, uh, thank you all so much for um, talking about things and really discovering the many things that we have within gardening. And I hope people get a chance to get out and try some new things. I think that's a wonderful thing about being a gardener is doing those exact things. Try something new next year and uh, I, I and talk to other gardeners. We're, we're a great community, a community of gardeners. So I hope everybody gets a chance to get outside a little bit and have a great week gardening or at least thinking about gardening.